Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on password policy guidelines. I hope you guys are doing great. I am Jeannie Jessica, Sales and Marketing Executive at Celebrate. Today we are going to have a webinar with Roger Grimes. Roger deserves a great introduction considering his long list of achievements and his extensive experience on cybersecurity. He is data driven defense evangelist for no before author of 13 books and over 1100 national magazine articles on computer security. Roger is a frequent speaker at national computer security conferences and was the weekly security columnist at Infoworld and CSO magazines between 2005 to 2019. He has worked at some of the world's largest computer security companies including Foundstone, McAfee and Microsoft. He is frequently interviewed and quoted in the media including Newsweek, CNN, NPR and WST. Well, we are pleased and honored to invite such a highly achieved person in our webinar series. So audience, by reading the title of this webinar, you must have got idea by now on what he's going to speak today. So I won't take much time now, i let him handle this session. Roger, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, again, if you haven't met me, Roger Grimes, probably the most important thing to know is I talk fast. I'm a fire hose of information. Uh, so over the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna try to give you as much information that I know of on passwords and how to protect your password and login security as I can. There are some of my books. I work for Know Before. We're the world's largest security awareness training platform vendor. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about passwords and because we all, you know, you always hear about passwords being a problem and sometimes maybe about passwords going away completely, although I'm not sure when that will happen. But in general, we do have problems with passwords are certainly easy to hack and I'm going to talk a lot about that today. They're easy to forget, especially have, if you have lots of them and you have lots of complex ones. They're also hard to forget, you know, it's like a lot of people will be forced to change their password right before they go on vacation and when they get when they get back they're kind of putting in the old password and forgetting that they had the new password so the the brain pathways are still thinking about the old password they're also very easy to share with people and very easy to share among different websites which is a very bad thing that's probably one of their biggest problems but there are good things there's a reason why they're still hanging around the easiest thing is is that uh, if you know something happens and your password gets stolen or something like that, it's very easy to change your password and get a new password. You know, maybe that's unlike if you're doing like biometrics and someone steals your fingerprint, you can't really change your fingerprint. You know, uh, so sometimes uh, the passwords and just in that way are easier. They're easier to steal, uh, easier to forget, but they're also very easy to change, and that makes them you know easy to use and to administrate. They work with a whole lot of stuff, probably, you know, and I'm just making this figure up, but 98% of the world's websites and services work with a password. Uh, so it's very easy. You can even see babies, right? Operating phones at two and three years old that know how to put in the password to access their parents' app store account and, and things like that. And they can be secure if they're used and protected correctly and properly. Although that's not always the case, which is why they're easy to hack. Uh, so what I want to talk about over the next 25 minutes is just how they're hacked, what your password policy should be, uh, even when you shouldn't use passwords, which is really as much as possible. And and, and then we'll take some questions and answers uh, or take some questions. I'll try to answer at the end of the talk. But by far, the biggest password problem and risk today is that the average person has to log on to 170 plus websites in a given year, in one year, and only has three to maybe 19 passwords. I think the average person has three to seven passwords that they share among those websites that are unaffiliated with each other, which means that if a hacker is able to compromise one of your passwords, or you know that they can take over more websites that use the same password. It's very common for hackers to come across your password that has been stolen from some website that you signed up to five or 10 years ago and you didn't even know it was compromised, but it's out there on the web or the dark web, your password. And they'll say, oh, let me go see if this password of frog worked for Roger. Then let me go see if this password for frog works for Roger at his 
company or Amazon or something like that. Or sometimes many people, including myself, have had many passwords compromised over the years. I'm going to show you how to check to see if your password has been compromised. Uh, but sometimes they'll see patterns. The attackers will go, okay, here's Roger's passwords that were compromised by these two or three websites from 10 years ago. And I see Roger's using Prog 2 and Prog 3 and Prog 4. And if they can see a pattern of a, a particular keyword or something like that, or maybe use Frog you know, FB for Facebook and Frog TW for Twitter and Frog AM for Amazon. If they start to see those patterns, they can start to guess what your different passwords or what you think are different passwords are across multiple websites. And so again, they can take this one compromise and try to comprom make more compromises happen. Here are the popular password types. If you're to break them down into different buckets, Physical attack would be, well, they could physically attack you and go, what is your password? Or hold a gun to you, give me your password. Or it could be that they steal um, one, your laptop or one of your devices and try to sniff the password. There's a lot of malware out there like mini cats and stuff where if they get a hold of your laptop and you're logged in, they can run this program that pulls your passwords or password hashes out of memory. Uh, so those would be kind of physical attacks. Social engineering is easily the biggest way that passwords are stolen. You know, someone gets an email and it asks them, oh, you need to put in your password, login name and password, and that information is taken, stolen, and given to the attackers. By far, social engineering to steal your password is the most popular type of password attack there is, by far. Uh, sometimes they can just guess at your password. Uh, so again, if they find other older passwords and try to guess what your new passwords are, they can just try to guess at, they can just try to guess, you know, what your interests are, or, you know, try to guess using your kids' names or husbands or daughters or wives' names and that sort of stuff. Or they can just simply guess. If you give an attacker literally tens of thousands to millions of guesses over a long period of time, there's a good chance they're even going to guess your complex password. So password guessing, uh, to, especially today, is very, very popular. If you allow an attacker to use some sort of automated password guessing tool and to guess millions of times, uh, you know, before they're ever blocked, they're probably going to guess your password uh, eventually. Uh, password hash cracking is very popular. That's where most passwords, when they're typed into an operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux or BSD or Apple or whatever, is stored. The password is converted to a cryptographic hash that represents the password. And if an attacker can steal your password hash, they can try to guess what your password is by guessing at the password hash. I'll cover more about that in just a minute. Again, they can steal your password. Most common way is malware where your computer or desktop or, or, you know, or phone gets compromised by malware and that malware looked for and steals your password and sends it to the attacker. Very, very common today. Lookups, password lookups are just that sometimes your passwords have just been stolen in the past or socially engineered in the past and are just sitting out there on the web. There are literally tens of billions of login names and passwords that have previously been stolen that are sitting, sitting in lists that attackers and attacker tools, there's many tools where you can just say, give me all the passwords for Roger Grimes or give me all the passwords for noblecore.com and it will spit out every single password every ever stolen or social engineered from that person or that organization. So literally there's just tools where you can just look them up and see what's there and see if some of them are still valid. Uh, and then account takeover recoveries, that's where uh, you can go to somebody's account, claim you forgot the password and it will send a new password or a link or a reset link to an alternate email address. Or maybe it sends an SMS message or maybe it asks for some you know, password reset questions like what's your mother's maiden name, what's your favorite vet, what's your favorite car, those sort of things. And so an attacker can reset your password without you even being involved that they can somehow take advantage of the uh, account recovery situation. So these are the main ways that password attacks occur. The vast majority of them uh, happen through social engineering where they just steal your password hash. And really, uh, I'm sorry, your password. Uh, this is probably the main general ways that passwords can be stolen. So password guessing, where they just guess at your password or that maybe it was a default password on a router or device that wasn't changed. They can steal your password. Again, that's usually using malware. Uh, sometimes they're stealing your password hash instead and then guessing at the hash or reusing the hash. Sometimes they just ask the user what their password is. If, if you want to see some hilarious videos, go on YouTube and put in Jimmy Kimmel 
password. And what it is, is a series of videos that Jimmy Kimmel filmed for a show where he asked random strangers on, in Hollywood on the street, what's your password? And you'd be amazed of how many people tell them <laughs> their password on the street to a Jimmy Kimmel assistant. It seems insane that they would, but they do. And then again, unauthorized uh, password resetting or bypass. That That is fairly free. These are the, the main topics here. So uh, one of the bigger problems we have is this password guessing where they go, hey, let me, you know, I'm, they will guess tens of thousands and millions of times uh, or billions or trillions of times if it's a password hash, but they guess against it. And they say, you know, what is your password? Um, you know, and they try and try and try again. Here are password guessing defenses. The first one is use multi-factor authentication where you can. There's all kinds of different multi-factor and sometimes called two-factor authentication. But multi-factor authentication could be a, you know, some sort of token that you use uh, that could have like a, a code on it that you have to type in or maybe a code gets sent to your phone. When a code is sent to your phone, either to a phone application or using SMS short messaging service, sometimes the phone is the second factor. The phone is a token, as they call it. Could be biometrics, you know, it could be this uh, other dongle or USB key that you have to plug in. But the best way to prevent password guessing is not to have a password. You know, use multi factor authentication where you can. Unfortunately, you can't always use MFA everywhere. So all of us are probably going to have to have some combination of MFA plus some passwords. Um, some other strong things to prevent password guessing, change any default passwords immediately. So very common that when we get routers and cable modems and Wi-Fi routers and stuff, they come with the default passwords. You want to change them from the defaults. A hacker can go on the internet and go, give me, the, they can look up what's called the default password list for any device. And if they can fingerprint and learn what type of device you're using, they may be able to try the default password to see if it works. You'd be amazed how many people don't change the default passwords. You should always use strong passwords. You shouldn't use any password that's easily guessable. You know, you shouldn't use the most common password used uh, in the world by anyone is password <laughs> or password one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, or key verde, which are the keys on the keyboard, uh, baseball, princess. There's a lot of very, if you go look up on the internet, common passwords, uh, especially if you go to Wikipedia, go Wikipedia common passwords, you'll see that the top 10 passwords that are most commonly used in the world for the last couple of decades pretty much don't change over the years like it's password and Qverti and password one two three and princess and baseball and stuff they really are still the top passwords it's a or michael you know that sort of stuff so you want to use a strong password that's not easily guessable typically that means that you're going to have something besides uh, you know, a word in there. You can have some other symbols and characters, maybe some uppercase, lowercase, some complexity, as we call it. You want to enable account lockout policies on any user login portal that you can. It, you know, there's a, a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of uh, ransomware attacks are happening because password guessers, or they'll find a logon portal that doesn't have account lockout enabled. You know, that thing where if they guess five times wrong, it immediately locks them out and uh, they're able to guess millions of times against somebody's password. And even if you have, have fairly longer, more complex password, they're able to guess it over time. So you want to enable account lack of policies so that if somebody's guessing and guess is bad too many times wrong and what that number, the account lockout number is, whether it's three or five or a hundred, just make sure you enable account lockout wherever you can. You do need to make sure that you enable failed login monitoring and alerting. So if you get a lot of, you know, above average uh, bad logon guesses that you uh, investigate that and you know, lock out the account so you figure out what that is. Sometimes it's just a script that didn't have the password updated, but a lot of times it's an attacker or malware trying to guess. Also make sure to secure and monitor your application programming interfaces. Uh, Acme, which is one of the world's largest uh, service providers on the internet, said that 85% of all password guessing attacks were made against APIs. Uh, so they actually, I think they, they were able to, they um, monitored 61 billion password guess attempts in a year and a half. 
but 80, 85% of those were against the APIs. A lot of uh, companies have these APIs. No before has APIs, but these APIs are meant for other computer systems to connect and then uh, allow, and many times they allow logins. They almost never allow MFA. So it's almost always password based. And a lot of people don't enable failed logon monitoring or account lockout on the APIs. So make sure you enable and secure and monitor your APIs if you have any. Uh, another common type of attack is password hash cracking. Uh, with password hash cracking, the attacker has to first obtain your password hash. And again, in most operating systems today, Windows and Linux and Apple and stuff, when you type in your plain text password of, let's say, frog, it gets, gets converted to this uh, password hash. That's how it's stored on disk or on a domain controller or in memory or in the password or shadow file on Linux. And if the attackers can learn that hash, extract that hash, and a lot of times they have to be admin or root to get to that hash, although there are some other tricks, like they can actually send you an email. I can send you an email, and if I can fish you and trick you into clicking on this malicious link, many times I can have your system send me back your password hash. So then what attackers do once they've attained your password hash is they put it in a password hash cracking tool like the one I show here, OpTrack, or it could be what's known as a rainbow table. You've got password crack, hash crackers and rainbow tables. They're slightly different beasts, but they do the same thing where the attacker extracts the login name and the password hash, and then it has a password dictionary with a whole bunch of pre-computed uh, potential passwords. And that they and they pre-compute the password hash of those passwords and then compare it against the stolen hash. And if given enough guesses, and let me say, when you have a password hash theft and you're doing this password hash cracking as an attacker, their account lockout doesn't work because it's not being done against your login portal where maybe account lockout might take effect. This, these password hashes are extracted and taken to these special password hash cracking computers or rigs. Uh, a lot of times it's just somebody's computer uh, with one or more graphic uh, processing units in it, those gaming cards, the, the processing units turn out, they, they do calculations very, very quickly. Each one, every graphics processing unit you put in a computer can do hundreds of millions to billions of guesses per second. And there's a lot of these rigs online, like you can buy a TerraHash rig for $25,000 that has 375 GPUs in it. And people can use cloud resources and cluster resources and parallel processing so that when they get a, a password hash, they can guess literally billions of times a second trying to figure out what that password hash equates to as a plain text password. Lots of different tools you can use. OpCrack is one. That's a GUI one that only works on Windows. Really, most people don't use it. I only showed you it here so you can kind of see what a password hash cracker look like. Uh, I used to use John the Ripper a lot when I did password hash cracking, although today the tool that almost every hacker uses, I think it's only on Linux. I, I guess you could get it on Windows, but it wouldn't run as efficiently as Hashcat. So most password hash crackers get your password hash. They you know, bring them into a computer with a bunch of uh, graphical processing units. They then run the program Hashcat and they try to cycle and do billions of guesses per second. The world record right now on a single graphic graphical processing unit rig is 121 billion password guesses against Windows NT password hashes. That's what Windows stores its password hashes and T hashes. They're able to guess 121 billion password guesses a second. So if they are allowed to guess as many times as they want over a long period of time at 121 billion guesses per second, there's a really, really good chance that they're going to figure out what your password is. The world record for a massive GPU rig was 350 billion password guesses per second. Uh, but given the speed on just a regular password hash cracking rig, an eight character NT password hash can be cracked in under two hours uh, or in 12 minutes using $25 of cloud processing power. Let me say this again. If you have a Windows password that's eight characters or long or less, regardless of its complexity, and the attacker is able to get your password hash, they can crack it in under two hours and sometimes only in minutes. Uh, so if you are worried, you know, getting your password hash takes the hacker some finesse. They have to be root, they have to be admin or even domain admin if they're on a domain controller or have tricked you using that email link that I talked about. But if they get your hash, there's a good chance if your password is not very long that they're going to be able to figure out what it is. Uh, matter of fact, a 10 character 
what's called SHA-256 hash was cracked in five days. Essentially what this means is that if you want to make your password uncrackable, so you're, you're, you want to make your you want to make your Windows password uncrackable. Let me say for for Linux as well and and, and and Macs, uncrackable. That if they get your hash from being able to turn it into your plain text password, you need a 16 character password. I think the longest password that we know that was ever cracked is 12 characters, although maybe it was only 11, but let's say 12. And so the world experts, including me say that if you're worried about your password hash being stolen, remember that takes a lot of effort, it takes admin and root usually, or a really good email trick, then you want your passwords to at least be 16 characters or long. Uh, and let me say, we used to say, oh, it needs to be eight characters long and 10 characters and 12 characters. Now as the password hash cracking rigs get more developed, we now say 16 characters or longer with some complexity. And, and maybe in a couple of years, we'll be seeing 18 characters and maybe nation states like China and NSA and stuff like that, maybe they can already crack these 16 character passwords, but we don't know that they can. So if you want a decent chance of protecting your password from being cracked, if they get the password hash, which is not the vast majority of attacks, but if they get your password hash and you don't want to crack it, you need at least a 16 character password. If you want to find out if your password has already been stolen and cracked by hackers and placed on the web or the dark web, there's many websites you can go to, including this is probably the most famous website by a guy named Troy Hunt that either worked for Microsoft or used to work for Microsoft called Have I Been Pawned. You can go in there and put in your email address. Uh, and you've seen the example here, I put in my Roger G at Nova 4 and it's like, nope, you know, it's never been stolen or cracked. I put in my personal email address, Roger at Banner at CS.com. And it says, oh no, there's been pond in 10 breach sites. And let me say, none of the 10 breaches involve me doing something wrong. This is for hackers compromised websites and sometimes very popular websites, Facebook, Twitter, Adobe.com, and some other lesser known websites where I bought some software products. but. If you go search for me, I've actually got my pa passwords are out there on the internet. And if you never searched or if the, the you know, you even search to see whether they're out there, your active today passwords could be out there or you could have maybe a pattern again where it's like frog one, frog two, frog three, frog four. So this is the reason why you need to periodically change your passwords at least every year so that if your password does get stolen and put out on the internet or the black web somewhere, it's not sitting there for 10 years waiting for some attacker just to grab it and try it. Now, a lot of the attacks don't care about whether your password's long or short. The vast majority of attacks don't care whether your password's long or short. That includes social engineering. If I social engineer you out of your password, if a malware program steals it off your computer or whatever, all these things here, they don't care about how strong your password is because they are stealing it or asking you for it or getting around it. And they don't care whether your password's long and complex. The only two types of password attacks that care about strong passwords or password guessing so and, and password hash cracking. So the longer and more complex your password, the more what's called entropy, randomness that's in your password, the longer it's gonna survive before it's guessed correctly or cracked correctly. So remember that the vast majority of password types are these first types. That's where, that's probably, I'm making a figure up here, probably 90% of password attacks. And then guessing is probably 9% of all attacks. And then password hash cracking is probably just 1%. But the vast majority of password attacks can be prevented by smaller password sizes. But if you're worried about password guessing attacks and password hash cracking, then you need longer passwords. Uh, so here's my password policy advice that I give to everybody. If possible, use MFA. You should use multi-factor authentication wherever you can because your password can't be stolen or guessed if you're not using a password. So use multi-factor authentication where you can to protect your valuable data. Unfortunately, you won't be able to use passwords everywhere. Uh, I'm sorry, MFA everywhere. You're gonna to have to use passwords. And when you use passwords, make sure you use different passwords for every website. Don't use easily guessable passwords. Make sure you change your passwords at least once a year. If you can use a password manager, there's password manager programs out there that allow you to create long and complex passwords and you don't even need to type them in, you can just use the password manager program. Those are nice because you can have a long complex password for every website and service that you use that makes it harder for attackers to attack you. If you don't use a password manager, you must use your own password. Use at least eight character passwords with some complexity and really longer is better. How much longer? 
I would say, you know, I, I try to go as long, I use a password manager for most of my passwords and I try to make them 16 characters and complex at least. Some of the websites only allow 10 or 12 characters. If I have to create a personal password, I personally try to create at least a, a, a 12 character password. Although 16 character password complexity is better just because it prevents more types of attacks. So that's my password policy advice. I worked for Noble before. We believe in training people and how to prevent attacks and then do simulated phishing tests to see if people learn that training. And we just know that customers that do that do training in the simulated phishing platform uh, test will decrease the risk of someone clicking a phishing test from over 30% to below 5% in less than a year. And that prevents a whole lot of password theft. With that said, uh, I've hit the 25 minute mark and we're gonna take a question or two or three or whatever, but I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, you have on password attacks. Thank you, Roger, for such an insightful presentation. Yeah, well, I have a couple of questions for you. So if you permit, should I ask you the question? Sure. Great. So the first question is, uh, what according to you is the ideal timeline for password set and reset? You know, th that's a good question. I think the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the U.S., NIST, used to say every 40, every 90 to 45 days. I think that's a bit aggressive today. I mean, so the, the more often that you change them from a security standpoint, the better usually. But what NIST found out is that when people were forced to change their passwords too frequently, that they more often reuse those passwords on multiple websites. And so it ended up being a negative. So NIST actually today, through what's called their Digital Identity Guidelines uh, document, that's uh, NIST Special Publication 800-63, Digital Identity Guidelines, they say never do forced periodic password changes unless you know that the password's been compromised. I disagree. I think they should be changed at least once a year. Uh, and that way, if a password does get stolen, does get socially engineered and ends up on one of those big password you know, lookup lists, that you know, at least a year or 10 years later, it's not still a valid password. So for me, I say change your passwords at least once a year. All right. Uh, so what according to you are the top three data points that security team should always have handy when creating password policies? Well, you know, I, I certainly think that, you know, the person should be use MFA where you can. Uh, try to use, uh, you know, uh, a password manager if you can't so that way you can create long and complex passwords and then if you are creating passwords make sure that they're always unique for every unrelated website and service and, and for me maybe if i add the fourth one in there at least make them you know 10 12 characters long if you can so th that would be my advice okay okay moving to the next question is binary decision making process for a secu security fix a adequate way for solving a security issue in an organization? No, so I would say that most security problems are not binary. There are some things that are binary in life, like did the bomb go off or not, right? That would be like a binary thing, but almost all security decisions really are risk along a continuum from you know no risk to complete risk, from complete security to no security. Uh, you know, it, it's like with passwords. If you choose an eight character password or even a six character password, it doesn't mean you're immediately going to be hacked. It just means you're more likely to be hacked. And as you increase your password, like some people say, never make a password that's less than 16 characters, or I've seen 22 or 32. You know, those are extremely secure passwords, but you can get the vast majority of benefit from a password somewhere between somewhere between 10 characters and 16 characters it cuts off a lot of attacks but if you can go over 16 characters then you're really decreasing those last bits so i, I most security decisions uh in the computer security world really all security decisions even outside the computer world is really along a continuum and if you can't do let's say 16 character passwords just try to get your passwords longer than 8 or 10 or even up to 12 characters right try to get that because every character increase in size decreases risk of attack so audience we have come to an end Thank you so much, Roger, for taking out your valuable time and enlightening all of us. We had a wonderful time with you. Hope you had a wonderful time as well. And we can't wait to have another valuable session on cybersecurity with you. Yes, viewers, you heard it right. 
Raju will soon be part of one more session on cyber security, which will be a live webinar where you guys can directly interact with him. Thank you, viewers, for watching this. Please share this video with your networks. And as I said, we all will soon meet on another valuable session. So until next time, goodbye. Thank you.